Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here with Talisha Farrow Jackson, the director of the SBDC, to launch the Small Business Fuel Show. Welcome. Thank you. I will. I'm not quite the director. What are you? Well, you know, I sweep floors. I, I do whatever know. I do. But Says now, the director on my notes. <laughs> I'm your program program coordinator. coordinator. Yes. Well, I was giving you is it, maybe I was giving you a demotion. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, you are. <laughs> I'll give you're giving Paul a run for his money is what you're giving. Well, he's not here, so he loses. That's there how it go. works, right? Always it's showing up is eighty percent of it. That's right. So uh, together, Paul, uh, you, and us decided to kind of create this show, Small Business Fuel, to spotlight some of the work that you're doing, some of the, the boots on the ground, the businesses that you're helping to get launched, as well as kind of meet new ones. Yes. And um, what was it like going out to the wild and saying, hey, we're starting this radio show. Do you, you want to come on and talk about your work? Well, they kind of get that from me anyway. I'm always like, hey. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> As I did press. Yes, exactly. Um, so they're they're kind of used to, but getting the word out and letting us, you know, letting them know that we're doing something new, something different, something right. And that and um, I forgot who I think Gary V says one is better than none, right? So yes. you got to go out there and talk and and spread the word because just one person listening could make all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, and the pre-show on Facebook Live, Stone mentioned that uh, that Stone and I and Business Radio X have been participating with the SBDC because uh, we found that through you, you were kind enough to share what you guys were doing and how you serve the community. And we said, you know what, we're at this kind of inflection point in our business, and it, this is going to be something worth having conversation yes. with. And then we've engaged with you and Paul. And really dug into our business over the last few months. And I know for me personally, it's made a big difference and we can see kind of the fruits of that labor. Talk about uh, the SBDC before we dig into this show and talk about the guests that you have here. Tell us mission and why a company, no matter where they are in their life cycle, where that they should be engaging. Absolutely. And thank you because we're glad that you were receptive Enough. A lot of times we get started and people say they want help. And then when you kind of start peeling back the layers, they are like, OK, I'm good. Right. Um, so we are the UGA SBDC Small Business Development Center uh, at GSU. We have 17, 18 offices strategically located in the Atlanta. Right. And the area. SBDC is nationwide. It is. Right. And then this UGA one is through the state of Georgia. That is correct. And of which your GSU kind of is a little Russian nesting deals. Yes, uh, yes. You can say. Or... And then that's where your kind of area is. Absolutely. So um, our little silo, mm-hmm. you would say, is in, at GSU. We're there uh, servicing Fulton County. Right. So we have other centers across the state of Georgia that service other counties. And usually affiliated with colleges or not always? Not always, but uh, we try to, you know, partner with because those are... Because there's a lot of resources there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we also have extended offices or centers that, uh, such as the Office of Minority Business Development, OMBD, and they all, you know, focus. We also have an international um, trade so center, but they all focus on servicing the small business community. And then uh, how did you get into this line of work? Oh, <laughs> so I kind of I was actually in corporate America for a while as a branch manager and an underwriter. And from that, I started teaching And from teaching every summer, whether anyone knows it or not, teachers kind of go through this self realization of themselves or self assessment. Mm -hmm. And so I had this epiphany. I'm like, Oh, I want to do something Mm -hmm. more. And not to say that teaching is not Mm -hmm. enough because it it is so much and more, but I just kind of went on. I wanted to get more into uh, curriculum Mm -hmm. design or programming and curriculum. And so with that, I came across the position with Georgia State University and being on a university campus and now within the School of Business, the J. Mac Robinson School of Business, 
I'm able to put forth those skills as well as learn skills by going to grad school, which I will be attending grad school. Oh, congratulations. Working on that. Mm-hmm. And it allows me to develop those skills. And then with the SPDC, I was hired as their program coordinator to monitor and um, help manage their continuing education. And then uh, program director, you're coming up with the programs that the entrepreneurs are going to go through? Yes, me. Uh, as you know, leading that team with my team, mm-hmm. uh, the consultants, uh, the area director, as well as, you know, the SBDC as a whole to just figure out what's important to our clients and what are their needs. And it's, the client is the entrepreneur. That is correct. Right. That small business community, finding out what they need, those entrepreneurs, where are they lacking, what are they lacking or, you know, wanting more of. And so from that, we're able to develop programs and offer assistance in the best way that we know how. And then part of the services of the SBDC are these kind of programs that might be group programs or open to lots of people at one time participating. But some of the services are very personal and specific to individual businesses, right? So it's, it runs the gamut. It doesn't have to be kind of just, oh, go into an auditorium with 200 other people, right? It could be one on one, really kind of immersive. Absolutely. So you have the continuing education uh, sign it's the side of it, in a sense, uh, that we can offer as a whole and uh, report those to the SBA so that they get ideas. And that's where your statistics come right. from, some of those. Um, and then the other side of that, that one-on-one comes as consultation. And in that consultation, you're able to have that one-on-one and reference and provide resources. Um, through the continuing education, we can, you know, offer classes as a whole to the entire community, or even for just a specific company. If you're looking to just do, you know, research and training or training within your company, and you would like us to come in and do that, we can also offer that as a service to you as well. And then these services for the entrepreneur are some are low cost, sometimes no cost. And that's what uh, is surprising, I think, to a lot of business people that they're out there battling every day and they don't realize there's these resources at their at the ready to help them. Correct. And uh, a lot of times people kind of feel like, okay, this is my business, this is my problem. And then they take it upon themselves and then they don't know where to turn. And this is a great resource. And this is one of those things where you're paying for this because this is a government program that you're paying through your tax dollars. Yes. So to not take advantage of it as a business person is silly. Absolutely. I mean, they're, and this is one of the challenges you have, which surprisingly, most people think, well, if it's free, everybody's going to do it. And this is a case where that's not necessarily so. There's tons and tons of people out there that are just could use this mm-hmm. and they don't have to pay for it. All they have to do is ask for it. I know. You would think, mm-hmm. right? Right. Some people put a higher mm-hmm. price tag on asking for assistance than anything else. Um, and surprisingly enough... People devalue no cost. Well, they're paying for it. That's the thing is you are paying for this. <laughs> indirectly. They just don't realize right. it. Um, yes. And indirectly, they're paying for it in the end if you don't reach right. out and get the resources and the help. And then some of the resources are things that if you were to write checks for would be extremely costly. Like consulting, business consulting is extremely costly if you were hiring a consultant. The market research that you have available, it would be extremely costly if you were going about it yourself or hiring someone to do this. Yes. And this is all stuff that's just available uh, for your asking. That is correct. Uh, Again, the consultation is of no charge. However, we do offer classes that sometimes, as you said, may or may not be of charge depending on what it is and who it's for. Uh, What's surprising, you said a lot of times people mention or pay for consultation and they do. They even pay for like business plans. And I, we've had a couple of clients that have come in and said I, they paid, you know, a ridiculous amount or Right, tens of thousands, thousands right, that, of dollars thousands for a thousands. business plan. Right. And I say to them, we offer a business, writing a business plan class for $69.99. Right. <laughs> you could have saved yourself a bunch a of money. A little bit of money, so, yeah. right. So, well, enough about the SBDC. The purpose of this show is to um, to kind of spotlight your clients, right? This Absolutely. Is, that's a, a big part of the show. So um, tell us who, who you brought today. Woohoo! In the house, so we have Perez uh, Roberson. 
from heavenly cakes. And I say from heavenly cakes, meaning the birth from heavenly cakes, <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's come. And he's one of our clients has been with us and just has so much energy, very articulate, delicious foods. I'm sitting here right now, just waiting until the show <laughs> is over so that I can dive into the, the taste that he's brought with us today. But this is Perez Robertson. Well, welcome. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about uh, the backstory. How did you get into, uh, is it baking? Is that, was that your first love? We or can say that. We'll yeah, say so, that for the, <laughs> for the story. Yeah. So I actually, my background is in interior design and architecture, and I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia. Mm-hmm. So go dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I first heard about the small business development center in college and baking was always there in the background. And I thought, well, if I ever go out, I know that I can go to the SBDC to kind of get started. Um, but my, inspiration moment, if you will, for my business came um, when I was um, probably about 15 years old. I was going on a summer camp trip with my church, and to raise money for that, we had a cake auction, and cakes had been selling for 50 and $60, and I made this huge German chocolate cake, and my cake sold for $375. Wow. <laughs> so I, you might be good that, at this. Did that cake have, like, gold in it or something? I don't know. So the guy sitting next to me was like, we should open a business. It should be a bakery. And I thought, I could see myself doing that. I don't know about the two of us together. And so, <laughs> You're like, good idea. Yeah. With that profit margin, <laughs> yeah. I don't need you. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of really where my I had always liked baking. So that was kind of the impetus. Like that was the moment where, hey, I might be good at this. Yeah. And so... Just, so you just put the interior design part on back burner then? No, not at all. So I practiced, I uh, graduated from UGA with that degree and I practiced. So you got work. a job and yeah. you were working? Working and growing the business on the side, like a lot of small So you, you were working yeah. for a company? Yes. You know, using your degree. Mm-hmm. And then just as a side hustle, you were doing baking. Exactly. Was it, it, was it cakes or was it always cakes? Yeah, it was always cakes and baked goods and things like that. and <laughs> For like your friends? I mean, how yeah. did they know that? Well, was so, it, whenever you they came the over, church, it's like, what'd you He, he locked down the church. Yeah, yeah he locked down that, that was, in itself. Yeah. Right. So I'm that, the guy who sells $300 cakes. You're going to want me for your <laughs> fundraising. <laughs> yeah. So that is kind of how it started, friends and family, which for my type of business, where it's food, that's typically how it starts. Um, as soon as I got my job, however, I was sitting at dinner one night and we were at one of our favorite restaurants. Um, and they always, when you walk in the door, they have amazing cakes. They're beautiful at the door, but I'm gluten free. So I could never have one of those cakes. So I went to the owner and said, Hey, um, you don't have gluten free cakes. So I decided, you know, would you be interested in? maybe try my cake. And he said, yes. So that Tuesday I came back with some cake and he loved it and put it on the menu. And so I said, well, maybe. So was that easy? Just made him a cake? Yes. Yes. Really? Like he yeah. made him a cake and he's like, yeah, well, it was, that good. <laughs> it was that oh. good. It was that good. So it was gluten free. And at that time, like when I found out I was gluten free when I was in college, like you couldn't find anything. Um, gluten free. If you went to the grocery stores, you couldn't find a good gluten free flour, which is really how my gluten free baking started. I couldn't find a gluten free flour that maintained the quality of the right. baked goods that I was making. So I ended so up So how'd you get around that? Well, I ended up developing my own gluten free flour. So and you that's... make your own flour. Yes. And so that's what. How do you is... even know how to. Yes. Yeah, so tell us about the gluten <laughs> part. Right. Right. And the gluten part. You can Like that's do. kind of important in flour, right? Yeah. It's what's been it? in there so, for a while. What's yeah. the hype <laughs> about gluten? Like, okay. what does it really mean to say gluten free? Okay. Well, first off, let's talk about what gluten is. Okay. So gluten is a protein that's found in grains. So wheat, barley, and rye. And so. If you're eating pizza, what gives it that elasticity is that we all love and that we all want is the gluten. That gooey? Yes, that gluey, <laughs> that gooey <laughs> gluten. <laughs> um, and so with that, being that the flour is gluten free, we are using things like tapioca flour and things like that to 
still maintain that elasticity and that flavor and that texture and maintain that moisture. So our products aren't dry or hard and they're never like cardboard. They're amazing. You would never know you're eating something that's gluten free. What if it's like three to five days old? I mean, like, so, um, our products have an amazing <laughs> shelf life because they're gluten free. They're not made with a lot of those fillers and things like that. That is common. So with that being said, our products have a shelf life of seven to 10 days, which is really great being that we're in whole foods. Um, and since we're not using a lot of dairy in our products as well, that also helps with the shelf life. Right. So now how many, um, iterations was it for you? Like, okay, I'm going to find this flower. There has to be a oh. way around this. Oh, like so, like it took a year to develop. So, <laughs> so what was your first go? You go, okay, let me try to do this without any. Well, no, of... I actually purchased so every gluten so free just... flower that I could find in the grocery store online. I went through and I tested everything, and the things that I liked, I started seeing patterns, and from those patterns, I developed. I started buying the base ingredients and started to formulate that way. So now, okay, so uh, how how does the process work? Like, there's the wheat that's growing. Right. So we purchase um, already milled flowers and grains, and then we combine them to be our blend of flour, which is proprietary. So it's a proprietary blend that is gluten-free. Yes. And it'll have all of the good qualities you want. Exactly. In, as if there was gluten in exactly. it. Exactly. There that goes just, that profit margin. From <laughs> that's that. trial and error. <laughs> yes, a lot of trial and error. And then, so how did you know you were kind of getting close? What were some of the clues that you'd like, hey, you know what, if we take this one and, this, and a little of this one? Well, I have a really good sense of smell. Uh, and the so, smell? Really? Yes, that was yeah, like nice. a... Yes. So when I started purchasing flowers, if I opened them up and the smell was too pungent, I immediately threw it out because that pungent smell translated into the flavor. Mm -hmm. And so oh. I didn't want that. So by process of elimination and going through, I was able to really understand what those ingredients were that was giving it that aroma and that flavor that I didn't like. And I was able to really start to understand what is tapioca and what is sorghum and what are all of these things. Right. So yeah. now how much money do you think you spent and just, Failing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Is it thousands Thou of dollars? Probably about a thousand, twelve hundred dollars. At that time, there wasn't a lot of gluten free flour right. out there. So I think like the most expensive thing I ever purchased was maybe like a hundred dollars. And that's because it was hard to find. It was coming from like California. And so, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then so you do this, you find a uh, kind of a ratio that works. Mm -hmm. And then you, you're able to use it in all of your. Yeah, products. so that's the amazing thing about our flour. We use it for everything. So it's so, kind of the base. So it is the base, and we don't change it. So when we're making cakes, biscuits, pies, cinnamon rolls, everything, um, pasta, pizza dough, we use the same flour. And, and then are you going to sell the flour by itself, or is this like kind of on the... Yes, yeah. that's one of the goals. Future that's the plans. future you. Future hey, don't you. try and get ahead of his I'm appointments just asking, and schedule time. The roadmap. <laughs> the roadmap. <laughs> So now you have this proprietary flour that who knows the secret? Only you. This is like the Coke formula. And SBDC. <laughs> and you know it too? No, I just wish I did. <laughs> yeah. So just you? So myself and one other. <laughs> one other. Well, they, and you can't travel together in the same plane. Right? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have this flour and then you start putting it in stuff and then you're, you just, is it still kind of one at a time? Like you went in that restaurant, you got that one. Primarily, yeah, because at that point I had just started my second job and it was like the job that I had really wanted. Oh, and now, so I got so into the, this restaurant and I'm like, oh wow, maybe, and this is after I took a year off from working to focus on my business. Right. And nothing really happened. So the same month that I started this job is the month that I got <laughs> That's into how the this universe restaurant. works. So I was like, <laughs> Absolutely. okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you see that? I do. You see that where the universe challenges you to see how bad you want it? I do. Okay, we're gonna carry on. <laughs> <laughs> sounds don't like, get me started. Sounds like she has some scar tissue. <laughs> yes, we all do. Yes. So yes. now you have now you have a choice to make, 
right? Well, not really. I uh, still needed a paycheck. The money. So, <laughs> yeah, so, there was, yeah. so this was an easy choice, but it, now you're getting positive signs. Yes. So that you're on to really something. It. So, so that's that important. It, yeah. So what happened to the interior design? It just so kept doing that, it. Well, yes. Yeah, so I practiced for two and a half, almost three years. And in the behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So I had an hour commute to work. I got there an hour early so that I could work on growing the business. And the goal for me, I had grown up seeing so many bakeries open and close. Yes. And so with that, I had the fear that if I just opened a bakery, it maybe wouldn't be successful because they relied heavily on the fit traffic. Um, so location was really important. And then when I set, started having to bake gluten-free, that whole that threw a whole nother monkey wrench into it, the, the fact that there's such a stigma against gluten-free products. So I decided that the best thing for me to do to have a business that would actually be able to make it and be competitive is to focus on the wholesale side of things. And that's what I did. So that meant I was looking at restaurants and that sort of thing. Restaurants and markets and things like exactly. that. So now this was a strategic choice. Yes. Right? So then you kind of played out the pros and cons of, okay, I have my own bakery and it's my bakery and I got to get people to show up here and that has its own yes, challenges, exactly. right? And Editing then, gluten-free. Well, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. And then, so now this other way has its own challenges because you don't have a bakery. So now exactly. you got to have a good, they're like, who are you? Exactly. Are. Like, Why exactly. should I trust your thing? And you, they trust you because they taste it. Yes. So that's and there's no shortcut it. around that. Yeah. So taste is key. <laughs> so taste is key. How do you get in front of people so that they can taste Right. At scale. Yeah. So at that point, I... Literally. So I was trying to get into hotels, restaurants, people that would need my product on a weekly basis. Um, and so it meant calling them, you know, I worked full time, um, and didn't want. So where was that guy at the beginning? Now you need him to go and knock on some doors. No, it was all me. <laughs> that was, was you did me. the whole thing. So, yeah. So, at- so you're making the cake. And then you're calling them up and go, hey, I got this cake. Well, no, I wouldn't make the cake unless I had an appointment. <laughs> yeah. But you would and make them a whole cake? Well, that was the way it Depending on what it is. So, you know, if you're going in front of a restaurant, um, they typically have an idea of what they want for their desserts. And sometimes it would be something that wasn't baked. So it may be a panna cotta or something like mm-hmm. that, which isn't baked. Um, so they really had um, – I had to listen to them to see what they wanted. But so what, walk me through that conversation. You call up a restaurant. Yeah. And you're like, hey, <laughs> it's Perez. I yeah. got some gluten-free stuff. No, you might be so, interested. <laughs> no, not at all. So you definitely would – I had to speak with the executive chefs or the sous chefs okay. of these okay. restaurants. Okay, who's the executive chef? It, that's Mary. Yes. Yeah, so, How do you get to Mary. So I would ask to speak with Mary. And, <laughs> and I, she takes your call? And she would take my call. So the key is I learned that you had to – I would have to – this is why I got to work so early. I had to go to my car and I had to sit in the back seat and I had to call them between the hours of 9 and 11 because a chef – is only available primarily during those hours ah. because they're opening the restaurant and then they have lunch service getting in right. and then they're leaving, trying to get their life taken care of after lunch when they close. So it was really important to connect with them in those key moments. And if I could catch them, that was great. <laughs> now, it wasn't easy to catch them, but, you know, But tenacity. they were open <laughs> to hear somebody else even well, though they're the, the chef and shouldn't they be inventing this gluten-free mm-hmm. is such a need it's a specialized yeah, thing exactly so that's always been the end the way that i could kind of slide my foot in the door because nine times out of ten they're they losing don't have money. a gluten-free exactly. option and this gives them one exactly and then so what you're saying is uh, i know you make your own stuff but here just have this on the side and this is another thing in the menu well Sometimes it was like that, and other times I would be offered, after we did a tasting, I would be offered the entire dessert menu for the restaurant. So I was manufacturing Even the entire thing. Even with gluten in it? No. You so, only do gluten yeah, free. Yes, so you we're only. exclusively gluten free. Okay. So, our so kitchen, you would remake their desserts, but with gluten with gluten free? free? No. So okay. by having the entire dessert menu, I would basically be coming, and as they were revamping their menus for the spring and fall, we would be incorporating your desserts and so we would do a tasting with them for the spring desserts and they would make their selections and it was uh we would co-do it together but i had the freedom and the flexibility to develop those desserts on my own and so that was fun and 
Is great. there a special dessert that you, or is there a dessert that you specialize your in? Signature. So your signature dessert? <sighs> Other than that German shot, that $300. <laughs> that $300. Yeah, cake. One of the best sellers is this birthday cheesecake, and it is just it's amazing how well it sells. It was first on the menu at the W Midtown a couple years ago, and they just keep coming back to it. And um, it's literally just, um, we make all of our graham crackers in house. So we have so many gluten different types of graham, graham. graham crackers because we have so many different flavors of cheesecake. And that's why our products are so gourmet. We get right down to everything and we so customize what's it. So, what's a birthday? So a birthday cheesecake <laughs> is a layer of graham cracker crust, and then there's a layer of cheesecake with lots of sprinkles, and then there's a layer of birthday cake with sprinkles, and then another layer of cheesecake on top. I'm sorry. <laughs> Where has this been? Really? So you can get you it You invented at- this? Well, I don't know that I invented it, but they just He made it gluten free. <laughs> so now, okay, so once you start doing this and the does the word start getting out like, oh, if you need gluten free, call Perez. In a way. <laughs> in a way, you still have to really work at it. Right, but I mean, like don't they talk the they, chefs? They do, but I mean, in a sense they do, but primarily it would be if a chef were to leave, they would oh, take then you they with take- you. And so, so you've that, seen that happen? Yes, I've seen that happen. Now, what about, do you have to make it like, okay, I'm at ABC restaurant. I don't want the same cake that's at DEF restaurant. Do you have to make me a special one that's just mine? Or is it just kind of they have some generic cakes that like German chocolate cake, everybody has a German chocolate cake? Well, for instance, not your example was a restaurant, but um, Whole Foods, when they opened their 500 store here in Atlanta, it was their store in Midtown. And with that grand opening, Whole Foods has a big push for local suppliers right. and local products. Right. And with that, we partnered with them and did an exclusive flavor. Now, it was exclusive to them for the first three months, a part of their big launch for this new store, and it was the peaches and cream. Now, that's available to... Right. So you, so you gave the, they asked for exclusivity and you kind of negotiated a period of time. Exactly. And so typically, you know, things aren't <coughs> going to be on the menu forever. So if it is an exclusive item at a restaurant per se, then it's exclusive while they have it on the menu uh, and then it's back in the pool and can, anyone can have it. Understood. Yeah. So now if somebody wants one of your cakes, like does it say heavenly cakes or is it something that is just kind of private labeled as part of that restaurant? No, so hotel? it is all heavenly cakes. So, so that's part prob- of you, what you negotiate though. Um, yes, at times they did ask and I was very <laughs> adamant mm-hmm. about keeping our label and keeping our branding. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really important to have. So was anybody you advising you on this or you, this was your own gut feeling? No, this was me <laughs> at this point. I hadn't really gone to the SBDC yet because I didn't have that in my back pocket but you know yeah it was so the so you made a lot of good choices uh, when you look back yes right some bad ones too yeah. but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, that's the beauty of business uh, all you have to do is make one more good one than bad yeah, and you're still right. hanging around now what was the impetus to get involved with the sbdc so the opportunity so i've always thought you know at some point i do want to have a brick and mortar i think that that's a big part of the business that still needs development um and getting the word out there because there's so many people that suffer with gluten-free sensitivities and celiac disease and irritable bowel syndrome and all of those things and i think having a brick and mortar would easily um more easily connect to those people and get them through the door um so in that hunt for the perfect space and seeing that that's something that I could do, I reached out to the SBDC to understand that process and some of the feedback I was hearing from the business loan side and all of that just kind of led me that way. What about mail order? So we do mail. Yeah. So um coming from the interior design world, I started doing a lot of branded cookies with company logos and mm-hmm. products and things like that. And so we ship those products and those cookies all over the U.S. to different reps and clients who are in the carpet industry, the tile industry. Are you still, is that strategy still wholesaling that or are you going straight to consumer for the online? So 
If you go to heavenlycakesbakery.com, you can see a full menu of all of the products that we have. And then we have a store section and we tailor that store to seasonal products. So right now, if you go to the store, you're seeing a lot of the holiday cakes and pies and things like that. And you have the option of ordering um, for delivery to your home or wherever you're located, or you can choose the option to pick up in store or in our kitchen. So, um, so, the, so I, as an individual, can go directly to you and get the stuff. I don't have to go to one of these restaurants. Exactly. So you can come straight to Heavenly Cakes, um, our kitchen. Everything's made to order, so you have to order ahead. It's not just stocked, but yeah, you can. Come now, do you up. do vegan as well, or it's strictly gluten? free Yes. So we are vegan, gluten free, dairy free, egg free, everything. Whatever you, think, oh, you, whatever you need. It's okay. So, so some whatever. things aren't vegan. Exactly. So, but some things you are. Need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. What did you think of that? I love it. Have you had his stuff yet? Um. No. I know you're eyeing it pretty hard. <laughs> I have not had his delectables just yet. So um, now for you, um, are you still doing interior design or is that? No. So um, after about of fully... three years, I left that position and I went whole. But you need to stay in contact with them and send them those cookies. So yes. So <laughs> they, I... they still buy from you? Yeah, yeah. they do. So, <laughs> there yeah. you go. They're still paying him. Yeah. It still works. It's working <laughs> <Right>. out. <laughs> So now what's been the funnest part of this adventure for you? The funnest part for me is when I look back on my job as an interior designer, as much as I kind of miss being creative, I get that creativity right. in what I'm doing. And I don't know that my firm necessarily misses me. They filled my seat twice now. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> but I feel like I would be missed if I stopped doing this or if Heavenly Cakes went mm -hmm. away because of the emails that I get from moms and dads and people who, you know, haven't had a biscuit in five years and now they can have a biscuit or a cinnamon roll. And so that's the. Do you remember the first time you got a note like that? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so what was that? Um, someone had tried heavenly cakes in the grocery store um and whole foods and they sent um me an email and wanted me to make a birthday cake for them and i just that was amazing <laughs> so that was the first time kind yeah. of a random person just hey yeah. can you do this yeah and so now, perez i have a question you know gluten-free and organic a lot of times it raises cost you know to the consumer and we're paying more for you know, to have that healthier uh, choice. Yes. How do you, how do you combat that? Or what, what is your uh, defense for that? Or do you do that? Is, <sighs> is it made up in your cost? Or is it that much of an increase in, in cost? It is, you know, so uh, being gluten free, I suffer with it too. So at the end of the day, I don't understand why I, when I want a hamburger, I'm paying for two hamburger buns. Correct. They increase, they charge me for the gluten free bun, but if I just get the hamburger, the bun is already included in the price. Um, I don't know why it's like that. Um, at Heavenly Cakes, we try to keep our pricing as low as we possibly can, but we pay a lot of attention to the quality of the goods that we're p putting in. So yeah, we could buy cheaper eggs, but I mean, you're consuming that. So at the end of the day, our products are more expensive, but I stand behind the quality of our products and I would put them up against any other bakery in time. And I would say that our products are better. Right. I, I mean, I don't think you have anything to apologize. It is what Absolutely it is. Like, not, you, you should, and it, and you don't want to be the low price person no, in town. No, no. <laughs> You're working for free and that's right. never a good thing. Because exactly. they are <laughs> heavenly. They that's are right. heavenly. <laughs> so now, how'd you come up with the name? Oh, well, <laughs> you know, he I, was on a church trip. It's where it started. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, when I, eat something and I eat cake, you want it to be a really memorable something. And so I thought if it's heavenly cakes, then that's something that, well, first of all, I thought it was so original. And then I tried to incorporate it and I saw that it wasn't. So <laughs> it was heavenly cakes by Ferez. So that by Ferez is kind of <laughs> that's important part of that. for the legal side <laughs> of things. But... Well, it was good enough for ham, right? Yeah. The heavenly, ha heavenly ham. ham. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's got to be good for cake. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, yeah. So now um we talked a little bit about kind of some of your future plans but what uh, 
how do you see this ending? How does the story end? <laughs> how does the story end? Well, you know, that's interesting because right now Heavenly Cakes is in a really interesting moment. If you honestly, because we're starting to um, work with distributors for our products. And so that's been a really big move. And so what that means is we're really embracing the wholesale side of things. Um, so we're sending out a lot more product and it's going a lot more places. And so that's really exciting. So what do you want though the most? What do you see? What's on your vision board? Like cake boss? Yes. <laughs> You're on the show. Exactly. That would be really interesting. But I think, you know, opening a retail location in a really interesting, really dynamic space would be kind of one of those big pivotal things. And I think down the road, you know, uh, really expanding, you know, on my vision board, Heavenly Cakes is the, um, we're the best gluten free. <laughs> or, or maybe even if it can evolve to where you don't have to say gluten free, it's just the best cake. Best cake. And yeah. it just yeah. happens yeah. to be gluten free. Well, you know, that's kind of what we stand beside behind now. I would say that about our products. You know, people don't just eat Heavenly Cakes because they have to. It's what they want to eat. Right. And that's what's really exciting. So Yeah. So when you've done that, then you've done everything. Now, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now, um, for any advice for that small business person who has a dream, they're working, they're working at a job. Maybe they, they like their job, but then they have this kind of itch. Yeah, for sure. Um, because did you go? I'm sorry, did I miss that? Did you did you go to any type of baking school at all? I never heard no, you mention that so at all. I was just asked to make so, a cake. For hey, right. A cake I'm like, <laughs> no so, decorating class. Yes, yeah, so no I bake. actually started um decorating with the Wilton method of cake decorating. So at a the Wilton, is that a yeah. thing? So at Michael's, if you go to a Michael's store, like all across America, they have cake decorating classes. And so my mom likes to say, I went to her and, and I said, I want to make all the holiday cakes. And she kind of was like, Oh God, no. <laughs> so you're, they didn't have an idea that you could well, do I what you baked, could do, but not, but I wasn't baking like at this level, not wow. then. So it was something that developed. There was always a passion there, but then as I got in the kitchen and I started exploring and then after I did the cake decorating classes at Michael's, I ended up getting an internship in a bakery. So three days a week after school, I went to that. So bakery. that's like high school. Yeah. So that was in high school and, Instead of getting a job, I went and did well, that. Well, that was so. a job. That was. And then, so you were learning kind of the trade and seeing what it was like yeah, there. Exactly. But you were always aiming at interior design. Well, at that point, well, I always knew I wanted to own my own business. I didn't know what that business would be. And so as this passion for cakes and cooking kind of developed, um, it just kind of came full circle. And so that's something else. I love being in the kitchen. I'm just as good as a <laughs> chef as I am a baker, which is really crazy because sometimes the creative side of cooking isn't the creativity. That right. You well, get baking, baking is like chemistry. Like yes. you, you can't kind of clearly like <laughs> creating its <laughs> own flour. <laughs> right. But that's like, you have to be precise. Yes. Like we're cooking, you can kind of. A dash of this. <laughs> right. Like an dash eyeball of some stuff. An eyeball yeah. of that. You know, once you get the basics down, you do have some flexibility in baking. And so especially going and understanding vegan, when you start taking eggs and butter and subtracting things out, you know, you really are able to see the necessities that you need to have a really good Right. They're there for cook. a reason. Yeah. So you got to replace it with something else that serves a similar purpose. Not exactly. You would think that you do, but you don't. Um, so I wholly stand behind coconut mm. oil. So if you're vegan or oil. you're trying to do something different, coconut oil is amazing. And, and it, it has like a sweetness to it that well, so you don't really need sugar. We, at well, Heavenly sugar is Cakes, vegan. wait, what? <laughs> sugar vegan? Yes. Yeah, sugar yeah. is vegan. So that's perfectly fine. I was like, mm -hmm. wait, what? <laughs> But, yes, yes. So, thank you for you affirming that. <laughs> I don't know where you get your sugar. Yes. From, you, from a cow. You learned that, huh? <laughs> you studied. I, you studied, yes. <laughs> but yes, so you definitely 
don't necessarily have to replace those things when you take them out. Like we're not using, when we make a vegan cake, we're not adding applesauce and or anything like that to replace the egg. We've just understand the ratio of flour to oil to liquid to really maintain that quality. So right. there are other things we do to kind of help the rise. But at the end of the day, we haven't just come and substituted. And that's really important. Um, a lot of times you'll, with the rise of gluten-free foods and things like that, you have to be careful because just because it says it's gluten-free, nine times out of 10, they've added a filler in there too. And so it's not always the healthiest thing that you could be Right. Eating. There, You can't equate those terms. Right. Like vegan, gluten-free right. doesn't mean healthy always. Exactly. Right. So your stuff, you're trying to be healthy as well? Yes. So our we're trying to make a product that is vegan or gluten-free that's still very healthy for you and not just something that tastes good and looks good. So the stuff you brought, is that uh, vegan and gluten-free or just no, gluten-free? No, this is just gluten-free. And it's these. just for Talisha. Is it's what it is. Talisha. <laughs> it has your name on it. <laughs> so now if somebody wanted to learn more and um, get a hold of some of these heavenly cakes, where do they go? You can go to Whole Foods, your local Whole Foods, or your local 365 Whole Foods store. You can find us at the Bantam and Biddy in Ansley. You can find us online at heavenlycakesbakery.com. Do you make their buns? The bin, Don't they make sandwiches, their, uh, chicken sandwiches? They do, but we don't make their buns. We <laughs> specialize on the, the savory. Savory side? The sweet side. They focus on the savory. <laughs> <laughs> So uh one more time the website? Heavenlycakesbakery.com. Good stuff. What Good do you stuff. think? How do you do? I thought he did exceptionally well. How do you think you did? Um she did I'm fantastic. going to go get my sugar from my cow. And... <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. No judgment. It's a judgment free zone here. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Perez, for sharing your story. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, guys. And thank you, Talisha, for making this happen. Thanks for making it easy. <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is Lee Cantor for Talisha Farrah-Jackson. We will see you all next time on Small Business Fuel. 